On this week's episode of The Video Store, Frank finally plays with his Legos, Josh joins the legion of Dennis Quaid, and we discover Vox Lux is Vox Fucked Up. Watch Twin Peaks. Welcome to the Video Store Podcast, where every week I, Frank, and my co-host... Josh, this guy. <laughs> we review movies and TV shows that we watch, and we look ahead to what's streaming on demand, out for rental, and in theaters to help you find something to watch. But before Hooray. we, <laughs> man, you're excited. Before we get to all that, Josh, let's start the podcast off with thoughts and trailers. Thoughts and trailers. We have three movies to talk about. You're um, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Josh, for pulling those. He he works. In case you didn't know, guys, he works hard. He, he took 15 so, minutes building this list. You know, Frank does the notes and the lists and all the information every week, and I just search some shit on YouTube, so I'd like to take all the credit, Frank, but it's yours. Okay. It's really not that hard. i just really slacking off at of work. Anyways, back on track. The first movie we'll talk about is Stockholm. It is coming out TBD, TBD in 2019. This one looks fun. Coming out TBD. Hmm. It's about the strange story, the true story, of the infamous 1973 hostage crisis in Stockholm that I assume um, started the phrase of Stockholm Syndrome. You got Ethan Hawke starring as a uh, solo bank robber. And, like a badass bank robber. Yeah, it looks fun. It's you know, like a, a comedic crime movie, and you know he kind of wins over, it seems, most of the people in the bank that he's robbing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks pretty good, and I think Ethan Hawke is at one of the high points in his career coming off of First Reformed, you know, a movie that he was well-deserved all the acclaim for. Well, I'm a huge Mark Strong fan as well, and he's in this. I didn't uh, notice that, yeah. You didn't notice? Yeah, because he has yeah. hair in this. Yeah, yeah. Um, that makes it a little bit weirder, but that's pretty big for me. And I don't know if you ever watched Preacher. Uh, you ever watch it? No, not yet. So the guy, I think his name's John Ralston or something. I'm not 100% sure, but the guy that's one of the main people – in preacher i think yeah, john ralston you got it he plays a detective in this yeah and i'm trying to rem- i feel like i'm wrong in, in the show i'm picking him out of but it's okay. uh he's fucking fantastic yeah so the, the good cast this has a fun vibe um i'm i'm in on this one i don't think i don't know if i'll see it in theaters i don't know if it's going to make it to theaters but this looks like a fun time and I, yeah i like ethan hawk right now i like what he's doing i've always liked ethan hawk up next is the movie titled Little with a very familiar plot and theme. It's about a woman who's like a uh, you know heartless, soulless boss in a corporate setting. She's transformed into her younger self at a point in her life when the pressure is off and adulthood, adulthood becomes too much to bear. So uh, we've seen stuff like this before. I think this one bears mentioning just because like the uh, amount of talented people in this. Regina Hall. Usher. Uh, sure. Usher. Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Marsha Martin is the young girl Issa Rae who's you know been killing it on HBO with her show Insecure and um, really just it seems like she's been good in everything she's also in Orange is a New Black but a lot of talent around a, a you know a very generic idea I don't know I'm like 50-50 on this one if it's a slow week in the theater and I'm all caught up I could see myself going to see this yeah this isn't one I'm going to check out in theaters but hey man a uh, fun cast can make for the same premises fun again so we'll see i mean i don't think anyone's done it as good as the switch up with ryan reynolds and bateman that was the last one where it was like oh we know this plot guys but damn it they did it amazing yeah when it works it works freaky friday you know that's like a body swap this is like a like a bit more of a big and even mentioned in the trailer like you know that's that's only for white people they only have time to do this shit so you know they got the little meta self-aware moment Mm. um in case you haven't noticed not a lot of huge trailers being dropped no comic book movies no sequels no remakes um, the final film we'll talk about in this segment is uh, Love is Blind, a.k.a. Beautiful Darkness. I like um, the first title. Yeah. Um, this is romantic comedy via sci-fi trope, another tropey movie that looks kind of interesting. It's a story of a young girl who literally cannot see or hear her mother, even though she is living with her. And, because she um, loves her. Yeah, and then she um, is seeking help from a psychiatrist who discovers that she can't see other people that love her because, like, his friend apparently, like, is infatuated with this girl and she cannot see him. So I'm a little confused, though. So she lives with her dad. So what? She just doesn't love her dad or her dad doesn't love her? I don't know. You got to wait and you got to watch to see. This is also TBD 2019. I mean, these, like, 
when they shoehorn these sci-fi sci-fi uh, ideas into a romantic comedy, I don't know. It gets me every time. Maybe it's because Eternal Sunshine is one of my favorite movies ever, and I just want another one of those. Yeah, Science of Sleep was also really fantastic. Uh, yeah. Gal Garcia Bernal or what have you. Yeah, both done by Michelle Gondry. So like, yeah, yeah I don't uh, think. What's the last thing he's done, by the way? What's he been up to? I don't know. Probably music. Yeah, we, we gotta look into that. Yeah, let's do it in the middle of the podcast. Just do some research. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not actually doing it. I know. I, I, I like your commitment to the bit. All right, so that's thoughts and trailers. Uh, lots of thoughts, not many trailers. Let's go transition so smoothly to what we watched. This is our review segment of the show. We have a very um, unique rating system. We either tell you don't do it, which is pretty self-explanatory. That is where we uh, sacrifice our time and joy and mental health to watch something only to tell you to avoid it. Um, Mm. Take it or leave it usually has its unique caveats, which we will explain. And then the employee pick is where we so boldly suggest that we know what you should watch and tell you that you need to check this film out. Um, I got you. So the first thing we watched, uh, you finally caught up and picked up on the Lego movie too, huh? Yeah, I did. Um, and I, you gave a good review. You gave a fair review. I still had doubts. Like, I didn't trust you. I was going to say Oh, that's it. fair. Anyway. You know, j- you hear that, Frank. Don't trust me. <laughs> Some you know how it is. Sometimes you just gotta find out for yourself. And um, you know, I, I could give you a plot summary. If you've seen the Lego Movie, um, this is a sequel. It's set in like a post-apocalyptic landscape. If you saw the trailer for this, which it's pretty hard not to, um, mm-hmm. you know what this one's about. The thing that surprised me is not that it was mediocre. You know that it was you know another sequel that suffered the pitfalls uh, you know the usual pitfalls of sequel, but why it was not enjoyable? It wasn't that fun. The action fell flat. Like the things that you thought would be easy, and um, you know, I kind of thought would be the bare minimum. They didn't. But when you have well. Legos and you can build anything, Frank, your imagination is the limit. Yeah, the first one was kind of a miracle where you know it's a toy property, but it had heart and it just like it just struck a nerve with a lot of people. And I really like that movie. I don't think this takes anything away from it, but I was kind of bored and I was pulled out of that movie constantly, dude. It just had no rhythm to it, had no heart, no soul. Okay. It wasn't just me then. I feel pretty good about this now. And it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, poetic that the theme song is everything is not awesome for this movie. (laughs) (laughs) Nor is this movie. I agree. I did laugh at the Raptors a lot. The subtitled Raptors. Yeah, and the anything that was like so cute, cute that it was disturbing. All those characters I liked, but right, there's like some gimmicks that kind of work, but it doesn't make for a whole, a whole enjoyable f- movie experience. Yeah, because there's like a lot of talent involved, but maybe their hearts weren't into it. It just or the chemistry wasn't there, like it wasn't the first one. We got some paychecks. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, tell me why I should watch Umbrella Academy because after 20 minutes, I was I did not like the sloppy introduction to the characters, and I was I checked out, and I've been told I'm wrong. Um, so I'm not like, you know, diehard gung ho. Oh my God, this is the best thing I've seen since whatever the fuck. But, um, I do think it's a really interesting show with a few amazing characters that develop very, very intriguing. And, um, I do think it has some episodes of very slow starting and some really drawn out areas. So I can totally understand what could have turned you away initially. Cause honestly, the first couple episodes are weak. Um, I really enjoy uh, number five, who I think is introduced in the first episode through a quantum time leap situation, uh, which turns him back into his like child self. Um, this all comes up within the introduction of some of these characters. I'm not going to go into too much on everybody, but um, it kind of jumps to and from the storyline of how these kids grew up with this insane eccentric father figure type person and i use that very loosely more like mad maniacal scientist with a plan um so i would say ellen page is a little rough in this show at points and act and I, I don't know if her heart was into this role or something about it came off to me as she was one of the weaker links within the uh, group of characters did it, but, did it seem like she was doing another show like she was on another show than everyone else uh, just not even that just kind of didn't feel like uh, her storyline was extremely compelling throughout a fair amount of the show. Um, it develops a little further. And of course, there's some hidden secrets, etc. But um, one of the also tough things for me was the talking ape. I don't know. I keep saying monkey, but I feel like everyone's gonna be like, he's an ape. Go with primate. I think that's yeah. the uh, 
Yeah. Sure. Whatever. So that was a tough thing for me to overcome initially, which I'm not beyond expanding my imagination, but it just seems so out of place. I'm sure it had something to do with the comics, whatever. But I think the most uh, interesting characters to me were Klaus. Uh, his ability is to speak with or see and speak with the dead people um, only if he's sober enough to do it kind of thing. Uh, also, these two time space leaping uh, hitmen that are part of this faction that ensure all catastrophic disasters and things and stuff happen as planned um, by killing someone that creates some type of domino effect, which they're very fun to watch their characters develop with uh, one having moral conflicts and the other still, you know, being very faithful to the job. Um I think this is something where you could probably start at episode three and be comfortable. And then really? if you really like enjoy you skip it, the whole setup, uh, you could skip some of the setup because it's pretty drawn out. I'm, I'm saying for you, and this wouldn't be everyone's thing. It would be something that you would need to have, like watch that to be compelled to go back and be like, okay, I need to know how those characters ended up in this situation. Yeah, I think uh, if you could have just, like introduce those people organically when you have 13 episodes or whatever it is you don't have to do the origin i think it's only like 10 or so but i mean they are quite long yeah Um, hours yeah but honestly it's kind of like how i did game of thrones i started game of thrones off like right in the middle and then wanted to know how all these characters ended up in the situations that they were and then went back and watched the rest so um it's not for everyone that way and i think uh it's really well done good soundtrack kind of thing but um i don't know it I'm in the. I'm still take it or leave it on this one. Something interesting, and I think uh, if you need some filler time, uh, there's some fun characters in there that you might enjoy. Okay, what would you say the strength is of the series? Like, is it the comedy? Is it like it's just cool? Uh, it's fun? Like, I would say um, quirky character development through very abnormal situations. Okay, cool. I like that. That's, that's all I got. All right. Uh, as previously discussed. On the last couple episodes, 2013, 2014, like huge cinematic blind spot for me. Um, yeah. So I rewatched, or I, no, first time watching a film called Blue Ruin Blue by uh, Ruin. director Jeremy Solner, who's like becoming, Jeremy Solner. It's one of, you never like realize you like put together all someone's work and like, this is actually one of my favorite directors. Like, I really like Frank never realized. All right, so I'm done. He did Murder Party. Did you watch that? That was in our heyday, 2007, of the blockbuster days. No. Remember the I'm guy? With, no. if, if you've seen the poster, it's like a guy with two chainsaws, like an orange, like boxy car- cardboard box, like armor thing. So huh. he did that. He did Green Room, which I loved. Yeah, and I remember you saying how much yeah. a fan you were of. And then he, last year he did Hold the Dark, the uh, Jeffrey Wright, the Netflix oh, movie. Oh, well, that, yeah, yeah, fucking fantastic. Yeah. So he's really good with violence. And um, I think this reminded me that the phrase gratuitous violence is misused and overused. Um, it's That's usually fair. just a, a, when the people say that you usually mean that it's like heavy violent, it's very descriptive and in your face and the violence in this movie is, um, but it, it really, all his movies go through the situation and like how, why this person has to do this act of violence. Um, what's it about? Uh, the tagline for the movie is revenge comes home, which is a lame tagline for a really awesome movie. Revenge <laughs> <Yeah>. comes home. <laughs> but, uh, the plot summary is a mysterious outsider's quiet life is turned upside down when he returns to his childhood home to carry out an act of vengeance Proving himself an amateur assassin, which is a really good description for this character, he winds up in a brutal fight to protect his estranged family. So mm. a guy is take, released from prison who um, was accused of murdering this person's uh, parents. And he, this, this dude, Macon Blair, who is a familiar face, if you look him up, Josh, if you guys look him up, people listen to him. You've seen him. He directs, produces a lot of indie stuff. And he acts in it as well. He does a really good job. He's disheveled. Um, you see him like shoplifting stuff in the beginning. He's living like on the fringes of society. And he finally has a purpose. And that's killing this guy. And who, Fuck yeah. Who is like the – yeah, and he's like the mo- the monarch of this like shitty, trashy family. And he, From the Burroughs? <laughs> no, no. No. No Burroughs. Uh, but uh, so this family is like all like crazy and violent too. And they find out that he does murder him. So it sets off – this war where this guy, you know, this character has to um, either like reason with these people or kill them all to protect his sister and her children, her child. Um, and the, the scenes are so good. Like the, it, the intensity, it puts you in these rooms and these situations, Josh, where like you feel 
um, you know, both sides of the gun, like who's on both sides of the gun or the weapon involved. Yeah, yeah. And it's just really sobering, blunt force, trauma type violence. Highly recommended. I really enjoyed this movie. It's on Netflix right now. It's, I can't imagine if you like thrillers. Is the only way I could see someone not liking this is if they just can't stomach the violence, which wasn't right. over the top. And My mom would not be a fan. Yeah, it's justified. Shout out. Happy birthday, mom. Happy birthday, Josh's mom. But yeah, mm-hmm. Blue Ruin is uh, yeah, in a high, high employee pick. I really enjoyed that one. I might have to check this out. Uh, something something I missed, and uh, that sounds right up my fucking alley. I know you'll dig it because you appreciate like when we talked about you were never here. The camera work, just the, oh, yeah. the, the mood. It's not like as artistic as that, but just like really masterfully done. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, so I actually kind of binged watch accidentally uh, the show on Netflix. Yeah, it happens sometimes. Accidentally, you just didn't feel like getting up. Yeah. Yeah. As are you still watching this? Well, the remote's closer to saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's Good Girls. Uh, it's about three suburban mothers suddenly find themselves in desperate circumstances and decide to stop playing it safe and risk everything to take their power back. Women roar. Um, this has Christina Hendricks in it Love as her. well. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, Ruby Hill from Parks and Recreation. And, or I'm sorry, Retta yeah. from Parks and Recreation. And, and Mae Whitman. Only, baby. Yeah, Mae Whitman I, I also love. like And Retta, I enjoy her. It's, it's a really good cast of likable people. Exactly. And that's really um, what kind of had me interested in it right off the bat. So uh, if for anyone that saw kind of Widows, I felt like this was like a tamed down, not sitcom but episodic, lighter, comedic, yet dark comedy uh, version of Widows to an extent where women are basically off. Our lives are fucked. And what are we going to do? We're going to rob the Piggly Wiggly. It's the fruit and frugal or some shit. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And uh, the greatest character that shows up immediately, Rickety Cricket. Okay. Fucking yes, Rickety Cricket, and he is David Hornsby. If you don't know him, uh, he is a writer and star on the show Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, I was I was thinking I was like I knew that name, but he's Rickety Cricket from that show. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> just a great uh, a great little person to show up in something that I hadn't thought about in a while, and also Matt Lillard's in this plays the husband of um, Christina Hendricks, who nice. like I've kind of been wondering what Matt Lillard's been up to, and I guess this is something he's been doing. Uh, he doesn't really add a crazy amount as far as um, ability and and interesting character uh, mannerisms, but uh, it's really all about this little Three Musketeers group and how they're going to uh, get through life struggling in their own personal situations where Christina Hendricks has to, you know, their mortgage and some shit. Um, Retta's daughter has a disease. They have to get a prescription. Mae Whitman's kid. Uh, it, there's just, Everyone's got their own personal struggle. So they kind of bond over that to go rob this uh, store only to find out that some gang is using it to launder money and they come away with a lot more money than they intended to. Nice. Uh, so the gang finds out. Um, they have to pay the money back and kind of, you know, through an episodic weird situation of events, develop, you know, bonds and struggles and some really fucked up shit happens at some points. So um, it's definitely a fun and interesting show. And I think uh, I think you'd like it. Cool. Yeah, I, I know some people would definitely like it. I'm just thinking of certain friends of mine that like, like it. This is, seems like the way you're describing it, it's a little bit better acting and writing than your typical sitcom. Like it's high end. Right, and I wouldn't even it, – it's hard to say sitcom. I would say sit black comedy, sit black com. Okay. So it wasn't just like a comfort movie. It wasn't just like you'll like these characters and you're going to watch No, them. and it's a, it's a show by the way. It's yeah, yeah. Like, ten, like 10 or 11 episodes and it's de- – uh, they do, the cuts are kind of weird and seem almost TV-ish for some situations. But it's definitely not meant to be light all the time for sure. These characters do go through some real – uh, real pain and real struggles for sure. Word, and that's on Amazon Prime right now. And then it looks like it's like it's also a, on Netflix. Yeah, it's it's like a Prime and uh, NBC pairing. It's really weird. So you can see on NBC and Prime. Yeah, I think the yeah. second season apparently is about to come out or just came out. So uh, you know something new to check out. I've only seen season one, so it does leave you with uh, wanting more. Sometimes we watch the good old television. I don't really television. We don't really talk about that that much. Like I don't. I watch like three tv shows right now that's it and uh that's why i watch so many movies wait till game of thrones is back baby 
Have I mentioned that 2013, I didn't watch a lot of movies? Have I you know, Frank, that? I don't think you did. <laughs> but if you hadn't, now people know. What was I doing? I guess I had a life. I don't know what was going on. Uh, Frank, but, I'm pretty sure you're on a meth binge. Yeah. <laughs> this movie, Enemy, that I'm going to talk about, which is on um, Canopy. Which also sounds familiar as fuck to me. Yeah, something else. If I don't mention... Um, you know that I don't. I haven't watched a lot of movies around 2013. I don't also mention Canopy, the free streaming service, enough. Oh, I did watch this with your library card, Josh. Um, this is directed by Denis Villeneuve. Villeneuve. Oh man, I really should have practiced that name. Anyway, Denis Villeneuve. Uh, Villeneuve. Um, he did Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, Sicario. Um, he also did Prisoners with Jake Gyllenhaal and Hugh Jackman, as well as this movie, Enemy. And he's going to do the upcoming Dune movie. So um, maybe someone you want to go back and check out their filmography. This is a very easy, very familiar concept that you could <laughs> say is pretentious, uh, but I enjoy. I think when something like is pretentious, it doesn't always, always mean negative. But it's mm-hmm. about a mild-mannered college professor. I mean, he's an everyman. And he discovers, like, randomly, and it has that, like, that... Uh, the like uh, destiny type thing where this guy, this random guy just brings up a conversation about movies and he's like, "Uh, I feel like you really want to talk about movies, man. Do you have something to recommend? He's like, nah. And he's like, okay, cool. It's Jake John Hall's just like feeling the awkwardness of this conversation. And he's like, well, you know what? Give me something lighthearted. I could use something lighthearted. And he recommends this movie that a, uh, extra basically in it, an actor looks exactly like Jake John Hall. And he just goes down that rabbit hole. And it gets into that like evil twin type shit and goes in all these crazy directions and has one of the endings that I know will just frustrate the shit out of some people. Do you remember the yeah. ending of this movie? Um, somewhat. I do remember not being satisfied with it. So, that I, yeah, lingering so, taste is still in my mouth. I was like 10 minutes in. And I'm just reading like uh, some trivia on IMDb, which I rarely do. But it's cool because it added to the film where it's like all the actors were – uh, forced to sign a non-disclosure ag- agreement and not explain what the spiders were. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means, but I can't wait to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you about. The, the spider thing, you could say, is very pretentious. Um, but it has some really cool ideas mixed around a very simple one, and it's I think it's really well-directed, looks cool, and Jake Gyllenhaal just fucking nails it, dude, playing both these parts. Um, right. They, I think the characters were very distinct and well done, and uh, you just felt the paranoia in the character. Like, he portrayed it really well. The um, the women in it as well, the two um, lovers in question of the people, uh, Melanie Lawrence and Sarah Gaddon, like, they were excellent, too. A very small cast, but really good movie. Yeah, I just remember the tone uh, was very compelling, and it w- even though I may have not enjoyed the entire movie, I felt like I still was captivated. Yeah, it doesn't follow that three act with the payoff type thing. So let's just, we'll put that out in front. But um, it's a full employee pick for me. Like it's a full mind fuck too for everyone else. Yeah, I mean, of course it's Jake Gyllenhaal, and I love Jake Gyllenhaal's weird um, roles that he chooses. And I can't believe I didn't see this movie. And yeah. it's. it's Really I can't good. believe you didn't either. I was like, I'm pretty sure this is familiar to me. And I was like, oh, I did fucking see this bitch. Yeah. So Enemy, go see it. It's on Netflix and Canopy. Enemy. Um, so to continue the Quaid-a-thon, just to try and keep some type of um, continuity with mm-hmm. my watching habits, to try and help people remember the greats. No, uh, this He's is not alive. really. A great... He's still alive, folks. He is. <laughs> I know. I'm doing a memorandum right now. Um <laughs> A memoriam, rather. We'll be right. Uh, when he dies, we'll cut all these together. Yeah, and we'll be like, and I will remember. Yeah, all right. He never dies. Yeah, seriously, that jawline needs to live forever. <laughs> um, so I watched Legion again. This was a rewatch for me that I was like, oh, you know, I feel like this was an, a fun kind of watch. Kind of just, I felt like could, more could have been done. So anyways, to Legion. To clear, the movie, the 2010 movie. Yes, yeah. uh, I know. There's also a show. This is not that. So if you're watching them with each other, shit's not going to work out. So uh, this is a story of a group of strangers at a dusty roadside diner uh, come under attack from angels, um, and their only chances of survival is this other angel showing up, played by Paul Bettany. His name is Michael, who tells the pregnant waitress there that her unborn child is humanity's last hope. Okay, but if you saw the trailer for this, uh, it was a real grabber. Did you see the trailer for this or any of this movie? I, I remember it. I didn't see it, but I remember like everything around it when it came out. 
I just remember the hook being so good from the trailer where they're just in this diner and this old grandma lady sits down and she, you know, she orders a steak or whatever. And she's like, oh, how far are you along, sweetheart? And she's like, uh, blah, blah, blah. Where's the father? And she's like, oh, I'll be fine. And she's like, well, the baby's going to burn. Oh, the that's... baby's going to burn, you fucking bitch. And then fucking like rip some dude's neck out. And the hook right there was really good for me. Uh-huh. Um, I think the visual effects are done very well. I think it is over dramatized and the religion concepts in there are not driven too hard. So it's still kind of uh, funny and plucky. Um, and you, all these characters have their own little um, very cliche mannerisms about them from the entitled family that's broken down there to uh, the guy that owns the place that's been, you know, just living in the middle of nothing for so long also has our favorite star from uh, fast and furious tokyo drift uh <laughs> i don't remember his name but you know who i'm talking yeah, about um so but where's quaid coming on all this so quaid is <laughs> well quaid is the roadside owner of this diner ah that's i could see him owning a diner yeah yeah in the middle of nowhere basically he, had, he told his wife he's like this land they're gonna build that strip mall down there and then we're gonna be in the big money and then he was wrong and no one ever fucking showed up i mean their backstories aren't really that interesting they do a little to set it up and i think that's just enough to kind of give these characters their motivations mm-hmm. um but fucking Paul Bettany is cold as ice, dude. I never thought I would see Paul Bettany from remember when we watched him in that fucking tennis movie mm-hmm. um, to being such a badass. And I was really hoping this was something that would have set him in that like, hey, he could be the fucking Liam Neeson. You know, I feel uh, like that time, like 2010, they were really trying to sell us on Paul Bettany and not everyone bought like you did. Right, and I think that uh, Paul Bettany was pretty badass in this. He was, he was cold-hearted, man. He was like, he's all about saving this baby and no one else. Like, he gave no fucks. Uh, he's like, they're already fucking dead. He's like, he's right there. No, he's fucking dead. <laughs> now, would you say this is like, you know, junk food cinema? It's like, Yeah, this yeah. is a real popcorn flick where you just kind of watch a bunch of people kind of suffer under duress and attack. Uh, also has... Um, uh, another Fast and Furious crew member, oh god, Tyrese is also uh, shows up at this uh, bar. Is just another random dude who ended up breaking down on his way to go fight a custody battle or something. Nobody really gives a shit about these characters' backstory. <laughs> I think the Tyrese is a good barometer of how serious a movie takes itself. Yeah, and that's fair. I think it's really about the special effects and the different types of horrific angels they produce from the ice cream man that grows his arms and legs out and comes at you like a spider monkey. Um there's a lot of very interesting ways that the angels try and break down the people with weakness from and, and things like that. So uh, it's just a good popcorn action flick with uh, a little bit of who's going to make it, who's not going to make it. And uh, some badass Paul Bettany, which you rarely ever hear. Almost an oxymoron. So I'm going to put this under the employee popcorn pick. Something you only need to watch if you are just looking for something to watch some action and murder happen and stuff. It's good, though. Okay. And it's only uh, rental VOD. It's not streaming currently. You, you, you say it's worth four bucks or three bucks. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Cool. That's mm. good. So I did a bad job of uh, – the Amazon Prime releases last week. I didn't realize Thunder Road, um, a film that I've seen really good reviews around on you know all the film Twitter people I follow and on Letterboxd, and uh, it's just there. I've, I've almost pulled the trigger on buying this because it was like a nine ninety nine like in same time in theaters type release. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a really good movie. I'm gonna go out in front and say employee pick. It's one of those situations where this guy Jim Cummings is super talented, but we've never heard of him. And the one way you, sometimes you got to break through in the system of Hollywood and or even indie films is just make your own thing, star in it, and fucking bring it. And that's what he did in this film. It's based on a true story. He has a uh, like a short um, film. It's like twenty minutes of the same title he did in 2016. There's just like the eulogy part, which kicks off this movie. You know, um, I heard about this by the way because they did a movie premiere here with the guy with that guy. Oh, cool! Um, and I didn't go to it, but I, like this was extremely promoted because there's an Alamo Draft House theaters here that does a lot of like. Oh, they'll you're do, so lucky, dude! I, I yeah. wish I had an Alamo. I'd be there every yeah, week. It's, I know it is pretty cool to have that shit. They, uh, a lot of interesting people show up there sometimes to do some rewatch movies and theme nights and things. Yeah, this. So the tone of the movie isn't. Um, 
the same, but this reminds me of like when John Hader broke out Napoleon Dynamite or Danny McBride in Foot Fist Way. This is one of those type of performances that has that unique energy around it and a mm-hmm. guy who's just undeniably talented and interesting. It's about a police officer. officer. A police uh, officer. <laughs> a police in- thermometer. That's an inside joke where my friends act like, they're like, no, officer, I didn't have any drinks tonight. And I swear to slipped. drunk, I'm not that officer. <laughs> <laughs> yuck, 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 yuck. It's about a police officer who he faces a personal it's meltdown. About a cop. Following his divorce, the death of his mother, who he was really close to, and just his like he can't connect with his daughter, and he's like this. Sounds am- so depressing. It's not though. Like it does hit heavy, but the guy, the way he just his energy and like his outlook on life is just has this darkly comedic tone to it that is so unique. And like why you have to see this movie, Thunder Road. It's it's hard to explain. But it's just such a unique movie with its own like view of the world and its own like brand of humor. It's, it's fantastic, man. I really enjoyed it. The opening scene, um, which is an awkward scene where he's like doing this dance routine and paying tribute to his mom. It could throw you off, but like hang in there. It's really mm-hmm. something cool. It just starts off with footloose. No, he's got, I don't know what the song was, but it's, yeah, it's one of those like cringe, super cringe worthy, awkward moments that you kind of have a hard time like putting both eyes on the TV. You kind of want to look away. But yeah. So I have one more question for you about this. Uh, Is the title, uh, if you told me what the title was about, would that ruin any of the movie for me? No, not at all. Um, And is the title even relevant to the plot line? Is there a Thunder Road? I don't know. It seemed like a weird kind of hoaxy title, which also had a little bit of I can't even remember how much I love this movie. I think it's like The Place they live in or something or the Dundee. or the song that he's dedicating to his mom something like that yeah it's just a, okay. it's a cool title um everything in his movies is well is well thought out and just check it out it's free on amazon prime if you don't somehow have prime and you you buy your groceries in a, in a store like a normal person from a, a decade ago just it's worth five bucks it's worth 10 bucks to own it it's something that i'll revisit and it's one of those just like Unique movies you, you, you're happy to recommend to people. You want people to check out, and that's why I have this podcast. So watch Thunder Road, Employee Pick. I give it like four and a half stars. I don't, Damn. I don't throw around that half star very often, Josh. It's, uh, he got the jiggy four and a half stars. Yeah, I didn't watch a lot this week, but I watched a lot of good stuff, and that was my favorite one, I think. Okay, all right. Maybe something I got to go back and check out and get past the title and maybe the first five minutes of the movie. So I think I can do that for you. I can do that. I'm excited for our final review, dude, because Vox Lux is super polarizing. I was hyped about it. I couldn't see it in theaters. Tell me how excited I should be. (laughs) (laughs) As the air gets sucked out of the podcast. Uh, Actually, the air just blew out. Um, So... We watched that first trailer. As you may remember, we reviewed that trailer, right? Such a tease. It's, it was such a little tease of like Natalie Portman's playing this like Lady Gaga type pop star. Yeah. So I didn't watch the second trailer because I just watched the movie. Mm-hmm. And holy fuck, does that trailer not tell us anything about the tone of this movie or what the fuck is happening? <laughs> Whoa, there is a second trailer I saw they released that kind of does a little bit more into with the you guys know, the, with the guns on the roof and the motorcycle yeah, scenes and stuff. Yes, yeah. yeah. So this movie basically starts off with a school shooting. Okay, spoiler. It's well, I mean, it starts off with I don't think that's like if if anything I talk about happens in the first fifteen minutes of the movie, I feel like that's not a spoiler. Fair, 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 fair. I mean, look, nobody gave a shit that Steven Seagal died and fucking. Um, that Kurt Russell movie in the first five fucking minutes. <laughs> I did. Speak for yourself. Continue. Loser. Let's let's stay focused on Vox. Okay. <laughs> so, um, holy fuck, the tone of this movie was dark as shit, and uh, although compelling, and that one little scene that we see in the trailer where she falls over, like the, I'm, you're just kind of waiting for that to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, there's moments that you're just like, when's that going to happen? Especially with how fucking ridiculous this movie is, and uh, dramatic and intense. And I'm like, are they really going to drop in some light moment like that? And it was played to a di- whole different spin and still hit just as hard because of why that happened. And Jude Law basically takes her under his wing uh, as, you know, a manager uh, from an early on age. And I don't know if this is a spoiler, but I'll say spoiler alert. We don't see Natalie Portman for almost half this movie. I heard that. Like she doesn't show up until the second half. Right, which is okay. So it's not that much of a reveal. Good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think you should put it out there because a lot of people 
seem to be like their expectations were not met, and that's why they don't like this movie. So I, I, I think you're actually doing a service by giving people a heads up by, and saying that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, PSA. <laughs> um, it's very uh, interesting and – and as you just said, I would say polarizing and not in a bad or good way and just in a in a compelling way um, where you look at this character and how she developed through her life and and her morals. And I, I do think they do a little bit too much of a, a splice and time jump and uh, from, you know, her initial character to where she ended up. But I because I, I honestly I really want to know about those years. I really want to know how this wholesome person that had this compelling relationship with her sister and I would do anything for you and you'll do anything for me to being so callous and crass and hateful and jaded and mm-hmm. and malicious almost um, while also saying, hey, uh, you know, playing victim and why me? Why me? Um, when you have probably one of the more extravagant lives that, you know, someone could have. Um, it's dark, Frank, and you got to stick with it. But. It's um, it's emotional and I think an interesting look into the lives of some people that, although dramatized, I'm sure things like this have happened. Um, it's just, you know, it's very common for young, talented people to be overwhelmed and manipulated and taken advantage of and um, by other people that are utilizing them for their own gains. So I think it's a definitely, I'm going to say employee pick with, it's not going to hit everyone the same way, for sure. And I think um, it was just – it left a very lasting image. So, yeah, I'm going to watch it for sure. You, so you think it wasn't that people were misled with the trailer? It was just it's a tough watch? Like it's it's uncomfortable? Is that what I think – I, I would agree that at points it can be uncomfortable. Um, that doesn't deter and, me, so I'm probably going to like this. Like, but I also think they tell the story in a, in a – in a different way than lines up with normal circumstances. And it's not really, uh, as you would say, a three act movie. It's kind of, it jumps a little bit all over the place. The only thing that I kind of dislike was the time jump. And I wanted to see a little bit more of this character develop from her young age into the Natalie Portman character. Fair. All right. I'm excited. Um, yeah. The, the things that bother people about it, and you mentioned, those, those don't bother me. Like, I'm okay. Like, for example, Mother, I really enjoyed. Like, stuff that's uncomfortable or difficult to watch, I don't, I don't you know, give a film. Yeah, until the character's name is Frank Jiggy and he lives in Maryland and it turns out, you know, something <laughs> ridiculous. You know, you'll be like, okay, maybe this is uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. So All now, right. much better notes, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think we found some good stuff for you guys to watch. I hope you uh, at least find something you, you would like and you agree with us for the most part. Um, but finally, our last segment of the show, if you don't trust us, don't believe us, or you found none of those eight movies interesting, we have What to Watch This Week, a.k.a. <laughs> WTW. TW! Um, it's for March 4th through 9th, our year of Dennis Quaid, 2019. Uh, Netflix finally has the streaming debut of Disney's Christopher Robin. Um, this comes out March 5th. Wallace is pumped for this movie. It's, yeah. uh, it tells the story of a working class family man, Christopher Robin, a middle aged Christopher Robin played by, um, oh my God, I can't even. Jude Law? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've just had like a, the worst brain fart. Um, but anyway. I feel, like, I feel like it was Jude Law. E- Ewan McGregor. Please. Ewan McGregor. Yeah. So, look, Jude Law and Ewan McGregor are almost fucking identical. I know. I've, I just woke up like an hour ago. It's very weird time. Oh my goodness, my dog. Anyways, Christopher Robin. Um, this is a Disney movie, which I, you know, I usually lean on the suspicion that it's just going to be cookie cutter, feel good crap, kind of like what Mary Poppins was. Mm-hmm. But this working class Christopher Robin story, where he Winnie the Pooh kind of swoops in, where he feels like he's got to save Christopher Robin and help him rediscover the joys of life. It really worked. It's a surprisingly like uh, original and heartfelt Disney movie. It's also like anti corporations and pro union. There's like this pro union message that is like the bones of this story, which I thought was really interesting considering who made it. And it's just well acted. Um, I thought the Pooh and like all of the characters had this really cool look. They look like disheveled toys but they had like this uh you know they were come to life yeah i really did like the look of everybody and all i remember is when you initially watched this uh you didn't know i was doing a poo voice it was <laughs> oh, <yeah>. upsetting <laughs> sorry it's okay frank it's you, fine 
Yeah, your poo is not your strongest impression. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's the only thing on Netflix I thought was interesting, and that's going to be on March 5th. I think uh, you guys will like it because it's not the typical story that I'd go to, like, but it's it's generic at face, but I thought it was a really good film. Amazon yeah, some Prime, people grew up with these characters, so, you know, um, it's kind of fun to yeah, feel like I, a kid sometimes. I didn't, I'm not even that much of, like, a Pooh fan. Like, it wasn't... Um, you don't like... Who? It's good. I think there's it's some value for sure. It's on like the side of Sesame Street is like something that um, became a household thing, but actually has a purpose to it and it tries to like tell a, a good story and have good messages behind it. Mm-hmm. I, so I think it's, I put it on the good side, but I wasn't like nostalgic for it. I guess is okay. what I'm trying to say. Um, okay. Amazon Prime and Hulu kind of didn't put out nothing this week. So go back and look. I you know that they're their beginning of the month stuff. don't forget homecoming folks it's still out there go watch that shit yeah that's a good one that is a good one uh over on hbo go though they have the two-part leaving neverland series this is a documentary about michael jackson's long running relationship with two boys who uh, beginning at ages seven and ten respectively and their families these guys are now in their 30s and they tell their story of how they came to terms with that situation years later so if Oof. you're into that kind of stuff yeah might be, it gave me the chills just you talking about it. Yeah, it, it might be exploitive. I don't know. I don't know, but it's there. It's going to be a, a you know one of those water cooler things that we talk about. It seems like anything. Hey, did you see that Michael Jackson flick where he fucked those kids? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, oh. But you know, there's <laughs> there's a lot of that stuff. It's like the gut wrenching, the true crime um, era right. that we live in. Like that stuff is whatever I want to talk about. So I don't know how dark it's going to get, but it's out there. So maybe you'll enjoy it. I will probably more likely watch the other HBO go release this week. Team Titans go to the movies. Um, it's like a send up of Hollywood and the superhero movies in general, where the Titans are fighting for their own DC movie and a villain's manacle plan for world domination sidetracks them. Um, I've heard good things about this. I heard good things about like the comic. I have friends who are like the comic book guy incarnate. Like they just are very um, dubious of anything, and they really dug this. So, oh, okay, yeah. fair so, enough. Very short slate as far as streaming, but this is like the fucking VOD rental holiday. Or Fuck Mar- yeah! Or March fifth, and uh, I'll go through pretty quick because we've talked about most of these. I'll stop where it's kind of an introduction to the movie for our audience. Clove Hitch Killer, which Josh has already recommended previously, is available on all VOD formats and also on disc. Um, I'm finally going to see this. Yeah, Charlie Plummer, Madison Beatty, Dylan McDermott, the, like these guys put, bring it and put on a very fucking ominous performance that just leaves you a little unsettled, but it's a really good watch. Mm-hmm. So I'm really looking forward to that. Maybe even have a review next episode. Um, we mentioned Vox Lux moments ago. So this one's available on all VOD rental platforms and also on disc. If you Get out your DVD players, folks. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, then uh, something we haven't really talked about, Free Solo, um, a very uh, highly regarded documentary film about a rock climber. Um, if you've seen the trailer for this, like really awesome shots, just like a gorgeous movie and probably something that's going to like, you know, fuck with your vertigo. Yeah, maybe fuck. I don't need vertigo again, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's trying to, it's trying to replicate the experience and, you know, put you in the position that Jimmy Chin, the rock climbers in. So I'm curious of that. It's just been, so everyone around me has talked about it. So I want to check that one out. Um, something that I probably will take time to watch. Cause I dude, I don't know about you, but melodramas, I just got to be in the right mood, like stuff that like super dark and deep. Yeah. So this Ben is back. Looks good. It's it uh, is about Ben Burns, played by Lucas Hedges. He returns home um, to his unsuspecting family. Um, his mother, Holly Burns, played by Julia Roberts, who we yeah yeah her, yeah, who was really good homecoming. Welcomes her son, but soon learns that he's still in harm's way. During a twenty four hours that may change their lives forever, Holly must do everything in her power to avoid the family's downfall. I like it almost the, sounds like it turns into the purge. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's very ominous. Like I don't know where what that means and where. where? I will say that Lucas Hedges is like one of the young actors I kind of you know noticed has been in a lot of stuff that I like and has put out some really good performances. Like okay, um, Frank's got his eye on the Hedges. Yeah, you know, have you? You probably agree. You're just fucking with me. <laughs> um, mm. The favorite, which was one of my favorite films last year, is oh snap, fun. Yeah, again, VOD rental disc. Um, one 
well, three of the best performances of the year. Olivia Coleman, congratulations. You fucking deserve a fucking Oscar for that. The only re- there's like a couple Oscar awards that I agree with. That's one of them. Uh, you might remember uh, when she was in Hot Fuzz, which was so good. Yes, you know? yes, I know. Yeah, uh, to see those people like start in those roles and then like just right. destroy an amazing dramatic performance. Uh, so amazing. Like I felt so good about that. Me too. I, I I didn't watch the Oscars, but it's one of the things I did feel good about. You got to look at at least her uh, her speech afterwards. It's it's so adorable and endearing. I will do that. So yeah, that's one. I'll probably even buy that movie. I really enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. And then there's this instant family movie, which is a surprise hit where a director really? who yeah. <clears throat> I'll look up the director in a second. So this guy has made a lot of movies that I really didn't like, but this is based on a true story about the children's that the, the children's <laughs> about the, the children's <laughs> save the children's. I didn't get a lot of sleep today, kids. Uh, the children's that he adopted. It's a uh, Sean Anders who has previously done um, Daddy's Home, Sex Drive, That's My Boy. Uh, you know, he's a writer director. He also Ugh. he did both Daddy's Homes. Okay, so yeah, so this is like the first time where he tries to tell something like true to his life and you know, with a heart to it. And also, it's like it's starring Mark Wahlberg and uh, Rose, Rose Byrne, Byrne. And you're yeah. like those those aren't wholesome family actors. Like you don't you know what I mean? You don't think those that bit, uh, he ain't fucking Tom Hanks, okay? For sure. Um, but I hear it's really good. Uh, not a genre that I usually go to, but if that's something you want, like if you are a family person yourself, you're a mother or father or something, this might be something, you know, if you're looking for a feel good, easy watch that you like. So I wanted to throw that one out there. Okay. Um, a film that you and I will argue about forever. <laughs> Aquaman. I can finally watch it sober and maybe understand. I enjoyed Aquaman. Couldn't tell you fucking anything about it, but I am excited. There were sea horses. Yeah. So um, that's there. And finally, the eighth and final interesting movie. And I, I didn't just list everything. There's like 15 uh, relative titles that are out for rental. So if you only watch movies from your cable box, but somehow also uh, you know embrace the technology of podcast, if you're that person, it's a big week for you, man. It's a real uh, specific niche. Yeah, right? Uh, Creed 2 is the final title. I, it's so forgettable. It's so middle of the road. It, it, it's it's – like all the sequel things that make sequels bad, Creed 2 has, but it's entertaining. And it's, yeah, it's Dolph Lundgren. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, it has some really good performances. It's just not put together as well as the first Creed movie. Um, mm. Now in theaters this week, two movies that I doubt that will be in theaters near me, and then one that will probably be in theaters for three months. And everywhere. And everywhere. It's been shoved down our throats already. Captain Marvel is finally out on March 8th. This is about Carol Danvers. She becomes the universe's most powerful hero. One of the Damn it, Carol! most powerful heroes. <laughs> and she's caught in the middle of a galactic war. I think we know what this is. This is the final uh, you know, checkpoint before we get the end of this Avengers uh, you know, storyline. I'm excited for it. Um, final cash grab, rather. True. And hey, there's a, there's a blockbuster video involved. So, mm. yeah. Wait, what? Yeah, you didn't see that movie, that uh, scene where she like busts through a blockbuster because it it, uh, yeah. it reminds you at every point it takes place in the 1990s. Exactly, they try and hit every single 1990s note. Hey, you remember this? Mm-hmm. Hey, were you born after that? Have you never seen this? <laughs> Thanks. But uh, I'm gonna see this uh, opening opening day, so I'll have a review from me, and I suspect you will as well, Josh. Yeah, I need some action in my life, and I need that summer blockbuster feel because the snow has just been pouring on us over here, and I need something to go watch Sam Jackson in, damn it. Yeah, the, uh, they did that reverse aging thing to him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but to be fair, he probably just did it himself because he still looks like he's 32. That's true. A man's like 70-something. Anyways, let's not talk about Sam Jackson's beautiful skin anymore and facial features. <laughs> it's a whole other podcast. Guys that we love. Yeah, just draw line central. Dennis Quaid. God. I could go on for hours, Frank. Yeah. Hours, I tell there, you. There's this small film called Gloria Bell that I suspect we won't really get to see until it's like VOD. It actually might be one of those VOD slash theatrical releases. It uh, stars Julian Moore. It's about a free-spirited woman in her 50s that seeks out love in L.A. dance clubs. I'm a big fan of Julian Moore. I think she's like a super underrated actress that either um, – her choosing or not just like does these like little weird movies like she's not in mainstream stuff anymore it also has michael Sarah, sean astin in it and i thought the trailer looked pretty interesting oh it's got a uh, little sean astin little sean asty huh yeah when's the last well, time big sean asty and then this final one i think this is josh 
like uh, bait. This is Josh Bait. This uh, is Josh Bait. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, Did it, you put Chris Pratt in a fucking Western movie? Uh, Josh Bait. It's directed by Vincent D'Onofrio, which I went back I in his filmography, and it's not really a good thing per se, but this is a Western, the story of a young boy who witnesses Billy the Kid's encounter with Sheriff Pat Garrett. It's called The Kid. Um, yeah, it's a very indie, low-budget looking film, but because Vincent, Ethan Hawke, baby. Vincent D'Onofrio, yeah, he has some famous friends. He got Chris Pratt and Ethan Hawke in this movie. It's got Dane DeHaan. It's, and uh, Adam Baldwin, yeah, we, they, the they, least known Baldwin. They got at least one Baldwin in it. Um, yeah, this is probably, like we said, junk food cinema, like, you know, the, you know popcorn movie, that type of stuff. Fuck you, it's going to be a great Western. We don't know. We don't know. Um, but yeah, I, this looks like it could be fun. Again, I, just the look at it and the production quality, probably not going to be in a theater near you, but in a select theaters and, you know, in some sort of VOD or rental form. Okay. All right. Well, fair enough. I'm still going to watch it. I fucking, man, dude, I love a good Western and I love Chris Pratt and fucking Ethan Hawke. There's got to be, there's some things in there that just say, I'm going to watch this, good or bad. I do pride myself. And this is one of the other reasons we have this podcast. I pride myself. And once I know you, I can, a person, I can tell them like the kind of stuff that they will like. Um, and I, I knew that was like Josh Bate. Um, oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. So next week, I'm going to see Vox Lux, Teen Titans Go to the Movies, and Captain Marvel, and at least. Any idea what you're going to watch? Uh, yeah, I'm going to watch The Possession of Hannah Grace. Cool. cool. And also, I may catch – well, I may catch Captain Marvel as well. And finally, I may grab The Man Who Killed Bigfoot and then Hitler, or vice versa, whatever, which way it goes. I think it was Hitler first. Cool, yeah, man. well, that's, that makes sense because, you know, older <laughs> – Oh, and finally, briefly, I finished season two of Twin Peaks, Josh. Oh, great. And that's the end of the podcast, folks. <laughs> Real quickly, watch it's Twin Peaks. It's the end of the watch podcast. Watch Twin Peaks. It's available on Netflix. Podcast. It's available on Hulu. Frank it's on Amazon Prime. You to watch the show. He doesn't give a it fuck. It has I really some of don't the care. best I wish he'd characters the in any TV show. <laughs> it is one of the funniest shows. It is one of the creepiest shows. It blends genres like no other Seriously, Twin Peaks. It was I'm going to put that show in a blender. We'll prob- I love that you're talking over me. It just kind of works as a bit. Uh, mm. Yeah, Twin Peaks is fantastic. Probably the best show that was ever graced to us in television history. I hope everyone only finds the porno. So thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for putting up with me and or Josh. Um, and or hyphen. You can support the podcast. We don't ask for money. We don't ask you to buy mattresses or underwear. Just tell your friends. Just give us reviews and talk to us on social media. Interact with the show. Thanks for listening. Yay. Bye. Bye. Bye.
You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.